Organicus. Animaeus, all the men, right? On this day, Gaia rose early and ventured alone to the training ground to observe the dual training. The essence of spring was overwhelmingly potent here, especially around Ganicus, who was the embodiment of walking hormones. Gaia watched, unable to take her eyes off him, her smile blooming like a flower. And then her gaze shifted to another target, Enamaus. Making a surprising discovery, the man dueling with Enamaus was exceptionally strong and incredibly brave. Crixus's attacks didn't harm Enamaus in the least, but instead, they made Gaia's heart flutter. The Gaul is quite the beast. What name does he take? Apologies, I do not know. His name is Crixus. He trains in the style of Mermilla. Gaia jokingly asked, Do you truly appreciate the duel? Or, like me, just admire the gladiator? The answer was obvious. Sign of tragic inexperience. I have not turned such a color since before you were born. I am be your youth. And all the wonders you have yet to discover. Do not be afraid to pursue every delight this world has to offer. Melita cautions patience. Plucking flowers too quickly will bruise the petals. That's for a mouth that has only known her husband. After a while, Quintus arrived, troubled by Tullius's desire to purchase Gannicus. Then, Salonius mentioned that a prominent figure from Rome named Varus would arrive tomorrow. Tullius had arranged for Vettius to welcome him. Gaia and Varus shared old Roman ties, with high authority and a renowned reputation. Varus was clearly a person one could not afford to offend. Quintus found himself in a dilemma. Could he really sell Gannicus? During the training, Indus was knocked down and surrendered by raising two fingers, causing Quintus to fly into a rage and immediately order the coach to send Indus to work in the mines. Being sent to the mines meant never seeing daylight again. Poor Indus had never imagined that normal training could bring such misfortune. However, the master's orders were not to be disobeyed. Surrender in this house! I will see these walls fall to ruin before Missio is given! Decision is made. Quintus had made up his mind, believing Gannicus would eventually become a Primus and bring him glory, he decided to find a way to make Varus take an interest in Gannicus, which would leave Tullius without options. The next day, Quintus was prepared, arranging for three newcomers to intercept Vettius who was to welcome Varus. The task was most crucial for Indus, who was trying to redeem himself, and Quintus also hinted at Asher having another task. The three newcomers began their mission, Guessing Asher might have additional tasks, Quintus's plan was flawless. Without the brand of his slaves on the newcomers, even if caught, he could deny any connection, and he had another arrangement in place, which involved welcoming Varus by Gaia and Lucretia. Gaia had her own plans, considering Varus was still unmarried. She aimed to win him over as well, as Varus's carriage appeared at the other end of the street. The two hurriedly went forward to greet him. Meanwhile, Vettius also appeared on the street and Quintus signaled Indus to start his move. This operation could not afford any mistakes. Indus adjusted his mood, took a deep breath, and then, with a smile, approached Vettius, pretending to act on Varus's behalf. He successfully lured Vettius into a side alley where Asher and Dagon were lying in wait. When Vettius realized something was amiss, Indus dropped the pretense and knocked him down. Hearing the noise, Asher and Dagon quickly emerged and swiftly dealt with Vettius's men. Then, Dagon began to urinate on Vettius, executing a taste of his own medicine on behalf of Quintus. Indus was pleased to complete his task, meaning he wouldn't be sold to the mines, only for Asher to suddenly stab him in the neck. This was the task Quintus had assigned to Asher, fearing direct action against Vettius and concerned that Vettius, having seen Indus's face, might trace it back to him. Poor Indus thus met his unfortunate end. As for Varus, not seeing Vettius to greet him, he heard a pleasant voice calling his name. Turning around, he saw her. After a brief exchange of pleasantries with Gaia, she introduced her best friend Lucretia, and along the way, praised the Quintus family's wine, renowned throughout Rome. Under Gaia's relentless charm, Varus was predictably led away. And at that moment, Quintus peeked out, his plan having unfolded perfectly. It was quite a while before he pretended to return home, clueless, and then in harmony with Gaia, boasted about their Gannicus's bravery. Varus was surprised. He had thought Quintus's family sold wine, 
so he inquired how their gladiator compared to Vettius's. Quintus, aiming to leave a good impression, replied modestly, with Gaia interjecting that Quintus was being too humble. Vettius of this sh I was told by Gontalius that his stable is well stocked. The boy chooses gladiators as carelessly as his wine. High quantity of the lowest quality. <laughs> Come, let us sample a finer vintage. They quickly arrived at the training ground, where Quintus had the gladiators showcase their prowess. Present yourselves! Gladiators! 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 Varus wanted to see a duel demonstration, and Quintus was only too happy to oblige. He was considering who should face Ganicus, with Enemiles and Barca both being good choices. However, Gaia, having watched Crixus fight that morning, interrupted, recommending Crixus. But since Crixus hadn't passed the dueling trial, Quintus worried it would affect the show's quality. Yes, he is presented. I fear such a match would be overly brief. A blessing, considering the heat. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us move to it then. Crixus! Enemiles was frustrated, missing another opportunity, and Crixus felt a chill. Just last night, he had been seeking advice from Ganicus on becoming a Primus, and now he was to face him. Just then, Varus spoke up, wanting to see a real fight with real swords. Quintus couldn't refuse, so he switched their weapons to combat-ready iron swords. Crixus was shocked. How could he survive this fight? All because of that woman upstairs. Yet, the impending duel stirred excitement in Gaia. As Quintus announced the start, Crixus attacked immediately, clearly no match for Ganicus. He launched another attack, only for Ganicus to seize the opportunity and knock him down with a move of effortless grace. Quintus noticed Varus wasn't watching the fight, instead chatting and laughing with Gaia, which wasn't a good sign. The battle in the arena continued. Crixus was kicked down again, but upon rising, he employed a tactic learned from Enemas that day. Taking advantage of Ganicus's attack, he disarmed his left sword then turned and swung, in the ensuing counterattack. Ganicus was knocked down by Crixus, leaving Quintus in disbelief. Eager, Crixus attacked again, but Ganicus narrowly dodged, surprised by the newcomer's strength. So, taking advantage of Crixus's attack, he blocked, flipped back, and reclaimed his fallen longsword, wielding both swords again. Crixus roared and charged. <sighs> But Ganicus defeated him with a single move. Quintus was pleased with the outcome. Ganicus awaited his master's verdict, which Quintus graciously handed over to Varus. Varus then passed the decision to Gaia, as it was her choice. Naturally, Gaia didn't want her beloved Gaul to die, so she chose to spare his life. Let him live. Crixus survived, and Quintus continued to promote Ganicus. Before Varus could respond, Gaia suddenly interrupted insisting on taking Varus back to the mansion for some variety. Varus gladly accepted. Much to Quintus's frustration, he couldn't understand why Gaia would do such a thing. But Gaia knew Varus's unique tastes. Her actions were all part of the plan. Now, the couple had no choice but to trust Gaia, hoping she wouldn't disappoint them. Varus first entered the room, then brought Ganicus in, leaving Varus utterly stunned. Upon closer inspection at the training ground, Varus realized Ganicus was exceptionally outstanding, prompting him to approach and scrutinize him carefully. Melita couldn't bear to look, and despite Ganicus's inner reluctance, he dared not show any resistance in such a situation. Are you as skilled in its use as you are with a sword? With no other choice, he nodded in agreement, and Varus immediately asked him to demonstrate. As Quintus was preparing to clear space for them to fight, Varus clarified that wasn't what he meant. Much to Ganicus's relief, Varus had always indulged in pleasures, preferring now to quietly observe. He then chose Melita to join Ganicus. Both Melita and Ganicus were stunned and stood motionless, not knowing what to do. Lucretia attempted to intervene on behalf of Melita, but Varus was adamant. Quintus, wanting to fulfill the plan, thus stopped his wife's attempts to persuade, and Varus then happily turned to Gaia. Ganicus and Melita realized they had no choice but to proceed. Slowly making their way to the center of the room, Melita cast a final look at her mistress Lucretia, who could offer no help. Varus was ready, and Ganicus also looked to his master Quintus. With no way out, they began their act, leaving Gaia almost in shock as Melita's clothes were quickly removed. Meanwhile, Enemiles and the trainer stood together, 
as Quintus had relieved the trainer of his duties, passing them to Enamos. Thus, the trainer vented his anger on Enamos. Initially, Enamos was reluctant to strike his mentor, but after receiving a cut to his chest, he realized he would die if he didn't fight back. His wife and brother lay on the ground. He die. See it done? All actions born of necessity. As the spectacle inside continued, Quintus discreetly checked on Varus, who was thoroughly engrossed. Enamaus's fight also persisted, pushed to the edge of a cliff by the trainer. In a critical moment, he pierced the trainer's body with his sword. As the indoor spectacle concluded, Enamaus immediately sought out Quintus. He reported the trainer's sudden frenzy and subsequent death in battle. Quintus didn't blame him. Acknowledging his own decision had driven the trainer mad. Enamaus wished to see his wife and share his grief. Quintus promised Melita would visit him after her duties. Enamaus left. Unaware that his wife and Gannicus were the ones dressing inside, Varus prepared to leave, expressing a desire to see Gannicus compete again, but this time in the arena, with the plan perfectly executed. Quintus was overjoyed, quickly apologizing to Gaia for any doubts he had harbored. Gaia and Lucretia went ahead to start the celebration, while Quintus told Gannicus and Melita they had made a significant contribution to the household, but he warned them not to let Enamaus find out, as the consequences would be dire. Enamaus took over as the new trainer, inheriting the role. Melita, back in her room, scrubbed her body vigorously, uncertain how to face her husband, while some were distressed. Others found joy. Gaia passed by the couple's room again, peeking at them sneakily. Lucretia noticed and invited her to join, unlocking a threesome for Gaia, who was no longer just an observer. After cleaning up, Melita sought out her husband and the couple, both deeply wounded in spirit, could only embrace each other tightly for comfort. As slaves, they had no right to choose or resist. Gaia decided to perform an original show, requesting a cup of wine from Melita. Quintus was enjoying himself when suddenly his father arrived and took him away. Father. Gather yourself. I would have words. Titus had heard about his son being expelled from the duel and believed his son should not offend the powerful Tullius. Quintus's ambitions extended beyond the family training ground to greater achievements. He had already secured a champion slot from the influential Varus and expected to achieve success soon. He had already secured a primus slot from the influential Varus and expected to achieve success soon. Gannicus! Gannicus! Ho ho ho! The man is a jest, inciting more laughter than awe. However, Titus was not optimistic about Gannicus. The next day, he took his son to meet with Tullius in the city. Tullius showed great respect for the elder but ignored his son. Tullius knew Quintus was behind the attack on Vettius and that Quintus had stolen Varus's primus slot. Quintus denied responsibility, claiming Gaia had encountered Varus in the city and invited him home out of kindness. This revelation made Tullius realize Gaia had assisted Quintus, setting the stage for further developments. As the argument continued, Titus eventually sent his son away. Ten minutes later, Titus and Tullius reached an agreement. Tullius agreed to let them participate in future Primus in exchange for Varus's champion slot. Although Quintus was furious, he was powerless to act otherwise. Meanwhile, Varus returned to the mansion, bringing with him a notable figure named Cassucius. Lucretia initially thought they came for a duel, but Varus was there for pleasure and approached Melita. Lucretia tried to protect Melita, having failed to do so previously. Varus, unwilling to be embarrassed in front of Cassucius, threatened to revoke his primus slot unless arrangements were made. Following Gaia's hint, Lucretia agreed but still wished to protect Melita, suggesting a fresh idea. Varus was intrigued, and Lucretia promised a gladiator and a slave girl as gifts. Diana and Naivia were thrilled, anticipating spring and the attention of such distinguished guests. Cassucius quickly chose a filthy and ugly gladiator, then requested to check the freshness of the gifts. The request was reasonable and Lucretia naturally wouldn't refuse, so she had Diana and Naivia undress. Cassucius praised their figures but wanted to test for himself. Ultimately choosing Diana. I shall have this one. She's Realizing something was amiss, Diana and the gladiator were led inside by Cassucius. Outside, 
Gaia chatted with Varys, hinting at her desire for a suitable husband and returned to Rome. Varys questioned her lack of dowry, catching Gaia off guard. Lucretia quickly claimed Gaia was a treasure, after Cassius emerged from the room. Varys and he prepared to leave. A disheartened Gaia bid Varys farewell, while Naivia rushed to check on her friend. Diana emerged from the room. Meeting Naivia's smile with an inability to respond joyfully, the harsh reality awakened her from her beautiful dream, her eyes losing their former sparkle, 